All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I know there's still a few folks that haven't joined in yet, but we'll just allow them to, to pop in uh, as, they, as they get the chance here. So again, my name is Brandon. Um, I lead our sales team here at Lee Agency, uh, do a lot of work with our risk and claims management, uh, specifically to our, our senior living folks. And so uh, I just want to introduce Linda. Linda and I were connected to a, a good friend of mine, also a client uh, out of Ohio. And uh, Linda's been in the industry for years. So she's the founder and president of Census Solutions. Uh, she's also a licensed nursing home administrator with over 35 years of experience uh, in the long-term care space. So she specialized in opening new campuses um, and, and really focusing on the optimization of underperforming organizations, just helping develop their, their teams uh, and really spearheading innovative marketing campaigns to get those in, in kind of a turnaround process. So she served as a consultant to regional and national senior living and post-acute care organizations, uh, primarily in the area of marketing, strategy development, sales, revenue maximization, and most important I would say is communication. Uh, so she has just a unique blend of hands-on and operational skills, uh, just a, a tenacity for marketing uh, and, and really helping the folks she worked with achieve uh, success uh, and become leaders in their respective spaces. So I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to Linda. She'll have some housekeepings and she'll kick off the webinar. So thank you all. Thanks for your attendance. Thanks for giving us your time this morning. And please uh, be very candid and open in your discussion and dialogue and, and provide us any feedback at the conclusion um, and, and any questions that you may have that, that go unanswered. Thanks so much, Brandon. Um, Elise, are you turning over the host responsibilities to me? In, in process. Because <laughs> I don't want to do a shared screen until she does that. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. I'm going to get you your handouts and we'll get rolling. There we go. So hopefully all of you can see that. And uh, just to let folks know, we will be recording. Um, I thought I saw that on Elisa's screen. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Brandon, and for the hospitality and partnership here with Lee Agency. Um, always a pleasure to be in um, the Big Ten, Iowa State there. And um, just thank you also for not bringing me your cold weather. They told me you had snow on Monday. So for the next, um, just shy of 90 minutes, because I'm very mindful of making sure that all of you are out on time, what we're gonna be doing today is really looking at things from an occupancy maximization standpoint in the post-acute world. We might uh, thread a little bit of what's going on um, in the uh, assisted living side of things, but I know that we've got two other programs that are slated, one this afternoon, one on the I believe the morning of the 10th of November, that we're really gonna zero in on that assisted living side. Um, along with that, we're going to make sure that we address some of the things that are impacting all of us this year since COVID too, because that really has rocked our world from an occupancy point of view. Um, recognize my approach is gonna be different perhaps than other individuals that you may have worked with from a, a corporate or a, um, an agency standpoint or consulting standpoint. Because of my administrative and operational background, I'm always gonna look at things as how is it going to work operationally? How are we going to integrate something through your system um, that, that aligns well with the operation, which works well for your team and your leadership and is going to dovetail really, really effectively. And also it's got to meet the needs of your individual market. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. Um, we're not going to talk about anything that's pie in the sky that's like a retail industry that we're adapting to healthcare. You know, this is gonna really um, be all things that, that, that you can do and hopefully some things that you can activate immediately. Um, and then others are like, wait a second here, I wanna look at that first quarter 2021 or hey, uh, so-and-so should have heard this um, I'm so glad it got recorded, so I don't need to explain it, and we can just have them uh, watch the recording again, okay? So that's how we're going to look at it, and um, I'm originally from Chicago area, so not always an Ohioan, 
Um, but I've lived here and got licensed here as an administrator in 1983. So, and I was hospital administration prior to that. So when we're talking about our post-acute census and, and where we're at right now, um, this program was originally designed prior to COVID. I've made some tweaks before then, but as I said, I'm gonna integrate some other elements. Um, certainly we've had shorter lengths of stay. Absolutely as we've handled the more acute patients, um, some directly from the ICU. They were never even on a step down floor or in a med surge bed. Uh, they're coming straight to our post-acute environment from that. Um, but we've got patients that, are, that, are, that might be with us for a couple days. Um, our managed care providers are certainly dictating um, some of those, those lengths of stay that we are looking at. Some of, again, our, our preferred provider networks. Um, it used to be where, you know, we could sit there and have just a small amount of variance as it related to our post-acute environments, depending on your bed composition of long-term or more chronic care stable patients and those that are the more post-acute pre-planned short-term stay. Those things have to be balanced all at once. And the more focus you have on that post-acute environment, the more admissions you, you will have to deal with. And so folks that weren't used to having um, all of that going on, and, and it can be something where our staff, you know, they really want to develop those relationships. And it's hard to do when you only have a patient there for 48 hours and it's predetermined it's only 48 hours. How can we be impactful? And we certainly can. And there's also the fact that um, there's a lot of uploading of work. You know, it, it, it costs a lot of money to even handle the pre-admission and the admission side before you even get to the length of stay. So we'll address that too. But the shorter length of stay is definitely a shift. And for clients I work with, they could have um, the same or possibly even a little bit less in terms of their number of patient days in the course of, of their calendar year or their, uh, their fiscal year. But then suddenly they realize they have five times as many admissions. Um, so then that leads right into that increased demand for admissions. And that demand cuts across all days of the week, all hours. Majority of admissions that we track nationwide are after six o'clock at night. Um, it used to be where you thought, oh, well, there's going to be, you know, the admission is going to be 11 o'clock in the morning so that the hospital doesn't have to um, have the other meal and the extra therapies and all the other stuff that's going on there. Well, that's not the case anymore based on whether it's test results, the physician signing the orders, and in many cases, the transportation. You know, there's a shortage of transportation, which um, creates the, the weight of the patient, especially if they can't be transported any other way than, a, than an ambulance. We also have increased competition. Um, in, in some states, you've got a certificate of need process, which does limit the amount of skilled beds, but you have other players in the field that have spidered into what we are doing in the post-acute or acute world. That could be some of our assisted living centers that, that have um, the ability or tout their clinical capabilities. Um, some outside of their traditional scope um, where it's really pushing the envelope out there. Um, it could be the home care agencies. We've got the acute rehab, some freestanding. Um, the the long-term acute care hospitals will certainly dip into some of our post-acute, more medically stable clients, as well as the patient staying home, which is certainly what they're doing right now during COVID. We've got some really sick folks at home that are trying to make it work with a combination of perhaps home care and um, the family coming in or perhaps companion type services. And then there's more options in that market confusion that's there um, where, where people don't really understand what you do until they need it. Or they might not even understand your whole portfolio of what they what you offer because they only experienced it or know of someone that was there for perhaps some orthopedic uh, rehabilitation or services. They had no idea that you had a memory program or that you um, have a program that deals with, you know, bedside dialysis or perhaps ventilator services or extensive wound care. Uh, they may not know. Or there's the confusion again between especially the assisted livings and some of them that are handling the more acute care clients that of what you even offer. I always laugh when um, a, a facility will say, or someone will say about a facility, I never knew that you offered rehab or therapies and rehab is in their name. You know, they might be Van Wert Nursing and Rehabilitation Center and they never knew it. 
So there's, there's that going on. And then that dwindling long-term core, we're going to talk about that. The long-term core goes back to what I mentioned about the chronic care or extended stay residents that may be with you for many, many years. They're very stable, but certainly um, could not go home and be as successful or activate their healthcare habits or have the enriching environment that you do. And that individual, you know, they could, when they pass, and then you're looking at, wow, I've got to fill that long-term bed. Um, that's a tougher one nowadays because you may not get that person directly from home because they could go to the assisted living center. If it's again, a private pay situation, they might be looking at the home care with technology um, or they could be receiving some element of support services in an independent living senior community. And, and that's even a tougher one to, to be able to restore because there's those options out there and that, that community-based focus. And as I mentioned then on the last bullet point, it is that focus on the community-based services, the technology, um, congregate living, and some of the creative things that are there that are um, lower cost. And there's still people out there that, that still um, associate our post-acute environment with a tremendous amount of guilt. And that's researched a little bit now with the fact that um, there's been restricted visitation. Um, that, that I find the biggest obstacle right now is not the fact that you don't have quality uh, patients that, that could um, meet your admission criteria. It's the fact that the families um, aren't concerned about the COVID as much as they are the fact that they will lose touch or not have the connectivity with their loved ones. So when we talk about promoting optimal occupancy, um, I look at the whole healthcare, um, I call it constellation in, in that manner, not, not a continuum as we originally were always taught. Constellation, um, I always liked going to the um, planetarium growing up in Chicago area and looking at stars and star formations and astronomy and so forth. But I look at it as a lot of things firing at once where they're not constant, it's very dynamic, it moves, and we're all partners in this or we're all, we're, we're all important. Whereas everything used to just hub around the hospital, everybody's got some skin in the game on this. And to promote the optimal occupancy, we have certain factors that are gonna interconnect that are exceedingly valuable that we're gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna talk about relationships. We're gonna talk about the rating system, which we all are a part of, the systems, and those are your internal systems and your external elements that work together. Um, technology, certainly, how that can optimize what you're doing. Um, and so importantly, your leadership, um, that, that is something we, we are truly leaning on right now in our field, is leaning on that grounded, wonderful leadership. And then our capabilities and specialties. You know, what are our, our claims to fame or what are we really, really great at that we need to make sure that we are touting? So let's talk first about those relationships. Um, yes, indeed, you know, there's all kinds of other metrics that go on that we're going to get to, but I want to talk about how relationships drive occupancy because I'm a firm believer that this is still a relationships driven business. It's not the only thing that's out there, but it is an absolute influencer. And we're going to have certain players that are out there that are going to be in roles where they may say, Hey, you know what? I know what I'm being told to do, or I know you've got partnerships or I have these other things that I'm being told, but guess what? You know, I'm a decision maker here and here's who I'm going to be giving business to. It does happen, it still goes on. Um, if you don't think that if a physician, if they are asked, where would you have your mother go? They're not going to defer and say, oh, you know what? You're just gonna have to talk to the case manager. They're not gonna do that. In a, in a very direct question like that, or in your experience, tell me what you would do. Where would you go? Give me your top three picks. They will answer. So people will refer to who they know and trust. That's that's truly important. We do that even outside our field, do we not? Um, you know, I had a, a Subaru for the last 15 years and I just actually sold it to my technician a couple months ago. And amazing car, loved it. You know, it had a turbo in it, so it was fast, it was good. Not that I even drive fast, but it was just knowing if I had to gun the car, I could. Well love that technician and love how the dealership treats me. You know, I always get a loaner. They, they sometimes will drop it off 
you know, my car off at my house. This was even pre-COVID. Well, so anyone I knew that ever was moving into town and had a Subaru, I was like, you need to talk to this person over here because I know what it's like, you know, to have a, a technician that's great or to have a technician that's not, you know this. So just a car is one of those things, but relationships in our field are absolutely paramount. They're going to look at who's accessible and responsive. Nobody can go dark as it relates to um, owning your occupancy. And that's one of the big factors here is the administrators, the folks that are on this call, you guys own it. You know, it, 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 it starts and ends there. And truly, you know, the team has to own that as well because they play such a critical part in the, in the process. And accessibility is a, a key factor. So if your quarterback, admissions person or the marketer, whoever it is, who's getting those calls, getting those faxes on the portal, getting the alerts of admission opportunities, if they're, let's say they're with a family right then, and absolutely they could be, and they're having a critical discussion that is going to take longer than five minutes, who is the backup who's going to be also accessible and responsive? And our systems and our backup teams have to be really deep. So as we were talking about football, you know, Ohio State had their big win um, this past weekend. Um, you know, I saw Nebraska score first and I thought, okay, this is going to be a, you know, a really good game. And, and it never really got to that point, but they were going through and giving a lot of playing time to the second and third string players to ensure that they had the depth that they thought they did with it being a shorter season. And so this is the same thing with your, with your organization is really look at having a robust group there and that they do, they play that critical role. Maybe they're going to be a little awkward or they, their confidence might not be quite there as your quarterback is, but it's so important that they uh, take on those responsibilities and that it's seamless, absolutely seamless on a 24-7, 360 process. Also, they want individuals who are consistent in their actions, consistent in terms of um, their decisions on what types of patients you'll take and what you don't take, we'll talk about that. Um, consistent in terms of their timeliness and, 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 and the responsiveness or what kinds of information they need. Um, they just like that. They don't wanna to have to wonder from one day to the next um, how people are going to act or if they're handling IV therapy and they're, they're fine for these days, but then suddenly it's like, whoa, I can't take this patient. And they're saying, well, why not? Well, you know, if I accept one more, you know, IV antibiotic patient, you know, our nursing team is going to have a meltdown. You know, that's, they're not, they don't want to know that. They don't want to hear that. They want the consistency and they want you to tell it like it is. So being honest, you know, be forthright. Hey, look, you know, this is all cool relating to this patient here's a deal breaker. And again, maybe it's the person's an active smoker and they don't want to go on a patch and they violated smoking policies before and you've got a no smoking uh, facility. You know, that might be where it is. Or let's say we figure out something and they contractually have to agree. You know, there's, there's gotta be, yeah, again, I always look at what can we, what can we do to make this work? Or are there some possibilities? But to be very upfront about it. And also in, in terms of what your commitments are. I always, you know, there's, a, there's an organization I work with, our commitment for every single admission is five minutes or less. And that means we're gonna respond 100% of the time. Responding means we're not gonna just be out there with crickets that will say, hey, look, we got this referral, we're reviewing it, we will be back to you in five minutes or less. Doesn't mean we're saying yes to everything. That's an important factor. But we will say, you know, if we don't get back to you in five minutes, what we do for in that particular organization is for whoever that social worker was or that case manager that's manning the case, we find out, you know, we give them like 10 different philanthropies that they can choose from. And they pick that philanthropy and we make a donation in their name to that philanthropy. And so it's kind of, I mean, we do that as a, it's a goodwill thing, but it keeps us also very in tune to what our commitment is. And um, we can, we can again, we track, you know, how quickly are we making those decisions? And the ones where we exceed that are usually outlier, really, really complicated cases. Also, it's someone who respects their time. You know, these folks are busy. They've got dramatic caseloads right now, many of them upwards of 29 patients, which is a lot for a case manager. Um, their uh, manpower has been readjusted between whether it's working from home, uh, if they're one of the, the team members that's working on their units, have their units changed, 
and they just don't have the time for a lot of socializing. And of course they don't right now as it relates to um, restricted visitation in the hospital setting, but someone that's, that, that really gets it. You know, I've got a colleague that works as a case manager at a university-based hospital and several months before COVID, she called me because it wasn't even noon time and she'd already had over 30 vendors stop her at the hospital. And that was between home care, DME, assisted living, post-acute, LTECT, freestanding rehab, hospice. And she's like, I can't get anything done. And they said, well, you've, you've got to put some parameters in, which she did. And also they want to work with people who function with no drama. Now you're probably looking at each other. It's like, yeah, I don't want any drama either. We know that we have that. We know that we do. And, you know, COVID certainly didn't help that. If anything, it put a little um, fuel to the fire is, is folks that work calmly, very efficiently, that don't bring that added drama to the table. So let's talk about some of the current obstacles to strengthening our relationships. And these would be with um, the traditional referral sources. So when I'm saying traditional referral sources, you know, your hospital-based case managers, um, this could be your social workers, discharge planners, the care navigators, and those folks. Um, and any call them different names, you know, based on your market area. And, um, but basically those folks is who I'm speaking to. You know, there's limited access and enhanced security guidelines. This was already getting tougher prior to COVID. Now in some rural and metropolitan areas, um, a few I'll say urban areas, you know, I still have pretty good access. And prior to COVID, if I walked in, I had my lab coat with me and someone hasn't seen me for a while, it even might be five, six months. It does feel kind of good when I'm treated like norm off of cheers for the older people in this room that know what I'm talking about. It's like, hey, and I'm like, hey, you know, and I get a little more access. I never assume I'm gonna get it. I hope to, you know, you walk in there with, with posturally like you're going to, but in other areas, there's, there's dramatic enhanced security. You know, you've got your vendor mate, your vendor access, they're checking your, um, your uh, records, your drug activity um, with the drug testing. They're looking at your work record, your, um, if you've got a, you know, police record, all of that. Cause they don't want just people wandering around their hospitals naturally and then they'll take your photograph and so when you know there's some hospitals when you log in from a security standpoint then they'll pull up your photograph you better look like what your photograph has so some of the fellows um not brandon that you just saw because he's clean shaven but some of the other folks are going to get geared up for uh no shave november and they and the, some of them might look totally different than what their pictures are well they will definitely be cross-referencing to make sure you are who you say you are and then um they actually print out a, a, a temporary name tag, almost like a, a, an adhesive strip. It had, it's time stamped. It, it'll be dated. It'll have what unit that you're going to, or perhaps a number that relates to the patient you're going to see. Again, so that this, it's not showing the patient's number on, on the name tag itself or, the, or their name. But then you're staying within the confines of getting to that area. If they find that you've been there too long, because their security looks at that too, someone will seek you out or they'll uh, be looking for you. So there's those types of security guidelines. Also, um, technologies replace those on-site opportunities. You know, I'm a big one for making sure that we do that on-site assessment or that clinical liaison is checking things over because we've all had situations where we weren't given all the info or you can assess it yourself or it, it gives you those intuitive things that a chart doesn't give you, or someone might um, interpret or their interpretation of something as being dramatic or significant is not as significant as it really is. So that's where that clinician to clinician element is important. Well, now that we have the portals and other ways that you can ex extract the information from the chart, including progress notes, um, that it gives us, it gives us an opportunity to do that. Now, again, I kind of like the touch points of actually being with the patient. Um, many times, if it's a semi-private accommodation in the hospital, um, the person in the next bed's like, hey, you're from over this place, and you're able to do a little pitch there while you're there, or it's also good because it helps the family. I have found that if you were the first one to do the on-site, even if you were second or third choice, the odds that you have made that connection, you've made that relationship, you will get that referral. You will, you will lock into that admission. Um, that's tougher now, though. Um, and, but those, you know, there are ways that you can do this too from a, um, an iPad standpoint, 
or um, Skype calls, or again, that connection with the family. Um, gatekeeper scrutiny, sure, they're out there. Um, they're out there in the hospitals. They're also in the physician's offices because they're trying to keep those folks productive. You know, they, they know that when they're interrupted, you know how when you're interrupted, it takes you a little while to get back up to speed or you're sitting there thinking, oh God, what was I doing? And what if you were handling a pre-search with an insurance company or something, you know, what if you were inputting payroll or anything that's requiring really a detailed accuracy or your COVID reporting that you're all doing? It's like, oh my goodness, that's a, a huge um, time consuming effort. Yeah. You know, you, you just can't be interrupted on some stuff. And then they do have that increased patient caseload, as I mentioned, and they're all decentralized. You know, they might have an office. It's probably down in a dungeon somewhere, but an unmarked door where people can't find them and interrupt them that you go through, you know, several loads of security there, but they've, they're just, they're overloaded. And then also there's the decreased uses of your brochures and collateral materials. A lot of those folks are uploading those to their computers so that when they're talking to a patient, uh, they can pull it up. They're going to use your website, which is vital. And then they may just print those things off. So really, you know, you're, you're not going to have to utilize a lot of that stuff in that setting, which before we used to give them scads of those types of things. So let's talk about some of the new players on the field. And you can see it looks like a little football field here. Um, did that on purpose just because we're in football season. And um, these, are, these are folks that are definitely out there that even during COVID, you can connect with. Now, it might not be your traditional marketer, but administratively, um, administrators, you might be the right person, or, or it could be you know, someone from the corporate level or whoever handles like your CFO, some of those folks too. Really great individuals to connect with. So the first ones are these numbers gatekeepers. Those are the folks within your hospital settings and in um, your settings where you've got like freestanding emergency departments, your urgent cares, look at uh, the ones that are watching the payments. They're going to be looking at length of stay. They're also looking at write-offs. You know, just like how we cringe when we have to do a write-off um, in the post-acute world. And, and many of us are in nonprofits and, and we've got life care arrangements and we're here from a mission standpoint. But, you know, we, we still have to monitor those write-offs mindfully. Um, there's also folks that are looking at those readmissions, making sure that, you know, those readmissions, if they were at any time in that post-acute setting, even if they went home, they get readmitted to the hospital, we're, they're going to be looking at us like, well, what did you do? And they're not going to think that, okay, your managed care provider was squeezing and was only going to give you three days for that patient. But those folks are great to get with to determine where are there some trends, where are there some opportunities, because the case managers and folks might not see this information, or it's not up front and center of caring for the patient, whereas that's what they're looking at. These are the folks looking at it, what are the numbers driving the business? And, and certainly they have to give a number, a, amount, a certain amount of charitable care. There is a range of that that's required by law, but then there's, you know, there's other factors in there. So how can we be a partner in looking at various solutions? Also then your emergency department and observation specialists are vital. Um, majority of what I'm seeing right now is patients um, are opting to not go to the skilled facilities after their hospitalization. These are some, some again, sick, sick folks that you would traditionally get in our post-acute world. It's not because they're afraid of COVID or your capabilities or your um, ability to provide great care. It's the fact that they're not going to have the connectivity with their families. So they're going home. And then there's people too that are at home that are not going to their follow-up appointments. They're not going to their wellness checks. They're not getting any prescriptions filled. Um, there's a whole lot of things that they're not doing and they're getting really, really sick. And instead of going to those appointments preemptively or going and, and having the telehealth element, they're going to the emergency room and they're going straight into ICU. So emergency departments, they can be either direct employees of your hospital. Many of them are contracted through another organization because um, EDs are a specialty. Um, observation specialists, those departments also range depending on your hospital. Um, some hospitals are just now getting into the game of observation areas and effective observation areas. Some have been doing it for a couple of years. And then some hospitals had people sort of in observation and were bouncing around from unit to unit in the hospital, but still weren't technically admitted. I don't know how you can do that and be there for eight days, but it was happening. But anyhow, emergency departments, 
if you can arrange to get with the people that are running the departments, those could be the physicians themselves, that could be the, the managers of the departments, um, some of the key nurses, some of the secondaries, to let them know how and what types of patients you could directly admit from their department and how that could be done very easily. Cut through that red tape, have the protocol there, kind of a one-stop shop phone call 24 seven. Now again, you still have the right if it's not going to meet your criteria, but it's great to be that the one that they call first because I've got post-acute facilities, skilled nursing facilities, as well as assisted living facilities for years. This is prior to PDPM, prior to some of the changes out there, certainly prior to COVID, probably for the last 10 years, that we're obtaining a good 10% of their patients or residents through the emergency department. So if you need protocols on that, just reach out. Um, and those discussions, that dialogue is very robust. And you have to then paint a picture of what kinds of people you're looking for. You can't just say skilled facility referrals, that's way too broad. You've got to paint the picture, you know, the individual who's nutritionally compromised, the individual who really likes the attention from the EMS, you know, they know them all by name, you know, they're a frequent flyer. Um, the individuals that um, have fragmented caregiver support, markets where you can't activate the home care um, uh, staffing quickly enough, nutritionally compromised, socially isolated, um, medication management fall risks, all of those. Then we've got the infection control and isolation experts. I've touted for years to have an infection control physician that was part of your medical staff because I felt that there was always something that may be going on that they could um, have an impact in. And the individuals that are handling isolation elements in our hospitals, those committees, um, whether it's again, emergency preparedness, their disaster committees, their infection control that we can unite with, that they understand what your protocols are. You know, I've got a client that was COVID free until last week. And then some amazing center, you know, freestanding, uh, family run, second generation run place. And then they had some positive tests. Originally thought they were false positive. Um, they were not. And we still announced, we were very forthright in our market to let folks know, hey, look, this is what's going on. They are still the preferred provider in an urban area. And, and also because of how they conveyed that news. Um, we've got that under control. We've now got more testing going on tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I mean, really important for us to do and not to shy away from that. Um, when people don't have information, then that's when they start getting scared or they start making it up or making assumptions. We don't want that. Um, then we've got who's ever is responsible for the outliers. This depends on your hospital. It could be somebody in case management. Again, it could be somebody in that metrics unit. Population health out. Who's driving that? If your hospitals are part of a corporation, you can go up that food chain and connect with those folks as well on a Zoom call or something and discuss, you know, your interest and concern about those numbers and how you can be a solution. Because those outliers could be um, those really cl clinically complex patients. So some, in, some examples might be the, um, the patient who's got a trach and they're also a dialysis patient. Very difficult patient for um, external dialysis to care for because they require in many states an RT or somebody to be with them because they don't want to assume that liability for that trach when they're out there getting dialyzed. Well, is that again, a situation that's going on where it's stalling those placements from the acute care side. Well, maybe an area to look at is bedside dialysis and also have the capabilities to handle trachs or vents. You know, I know some of you are going, no, but again, there's there's places that are, that are moving into those in slow, mindful ways that are doing really well. And it could be bariatrics over a certain weight limit. It might be some of the mental health patients we're dealing with right now. COVID has definitely ignited that in all ages, but our senior population along with that and our, and our little bit younger senior population, um, baby boomers, lots of, of patients with that mental health component. Our physician extenders, um, 
don't put all your eggs in the basket with just the physician because the extenders have so much contact with the patients and the decision makers that are out there. Those extenders being your nurse practitioners, your um, phys uh, physician assistants, um, the surgery schedulers, the right arm nurse, you know, all and, and even the, the individual who's managing that office really get to know those. You know, for the physicians I work with, you know, I keep a roster of all those folks so that I can make sure I'm connected and that there's no fallout there. Because um, that way, you know, if a patient is going to need a surgery or if we're seeing a fluctuation in bed availability, I can make sure those folks know. And also it's really great to have that information of yours in the surgery schedulers uh, folders. Patients that we serve, your residents and your facilities love those extenders. They get more one-on-one -on -one time from them and they're really good with the families in terms of explaining things. The other part too is they can be amazing partners with the rest of your staff, with your nursing team, with your unit managers. There's good collaboration there, less um, what I'll call status and, and leveraging that occurs. And then we've got those analytics experts again. You know, those folks are crunching those trends. They're looking at where those patients are coming from, zip code wise, demographics, payer sources, ages, everything. Get with them. They will share their information with you. They, they really are excited about somebody even being interested in what they do. Um, and those analytics experts are just incredible right now. They are driving so much of population health, so much of the planning and the resourcefulness of what's going on that, that you can certainly tap into that. And again, it's building that relationship because they are definitely heard. And then again, our traditional ones are our case managers and those care navigators and social workers. We talked about them. Just realize that, you know, their worlds have been dramatically changed. Some of them have been downsized. Some shift to different units. So if you haven't seen referrals from someone that you know is pretty loyal to you, you know, you usually get a few each week from Jeannie and it's been two weeks and you don't think she's on vacation. So what's going on? Don't wait two weeks. You know, stay in touch, do that barometer check, you know, which is a fine line. You don't want to be a pest, but you know what? If you're out of sight, you're out of mind. So you always have to have a reason and always make sure, you know, there's that touch point, but it's much better to know, hey, she got switched over to OBGYN unit. Oh, okay. She's on labor and delivery. All right. And you've got some new person that's covering your unit or her caseload got spread between some other folks. All of those dynamics we want to be aware of and um, have to stay on top of all the time. So you know who your, your loyal folks are. We've got to keep, keep those nurses. And then we always want to add new ones. Um, physicians and specialists, we definitely want to make sure that they know what you're doing and get them involved. You know, I've got some specialists and when we're looking at um, design work or how can we get a little closer with them. And, and I'll say, you know, if you had your ideal setup in the room, what would it look like? And sometimes it's equipment that we've got on deck anyway, but they would like it in the room. Or could we have, you know, some certain other elements that are right there on tap? Sure. You know, when they know that we've got all the goods right there that they're going to want for their patient, and they all have their little specialties or their go-to equipment, their go-to medications, um, that's a plus. The other thing too is it allows you with the specialists, especially your orthopedic folks, um, to make sure that they get involved in what your best practices are so that when the patient goes to the specialist, he doesn't say, well, you know, I'm discharging you now. And they think they can go home. And remember, he's not the attending physician, he's the specialist. He has no idea what all these other things are that you're doing. Um, prior to the shutdown in the offices, I am a big advocate of having someone accompany that resident to their physician or specialist appointment as um, a, a liaison of your organization, as conduit for the patient's progress, and also to just, you know, give them some added support there. Plus, you know what? It's a marketing call that you're able to penetrate without it actually being a marketing call. Um, that'll loosen up, I'm sure, in the future. Right now, it's that's tough because they can't even have a family member with them. Um, then your other skilled facilities, assisted living facilities, your hospice and home care providers. You all have those that you work with. You all have your go-tos that um, when people ask you, you know, hey, what home care provider do you work with? And you've got several, you know, or a, a list. I'm a proponent of choice, absolutely. But I also realize there's some that do it better than others. 
And if I'm answered that or asked that pointed question, like I asked the physician, I'm going to answer it. Also, as the administrator, as the, the leader owning your census in your organization, you should be looking at what are those organizations bringing to the table to you? Because it's just not a one-way street with referrals. You should be receiving things from them. So if you're providing you know, eight home care referrals a month or 12 a month, you should be getting together with that executive director of that home care branch and saying, hey, how many patients do you have caseload within our primary and secondary area? If they say nothing, I'm going to start to question why you're giving all that business to them because it does need to be a partnership. Um, we all know that a one-way relationship does not work, but the, whatever site is getting something is going to let you do that for as long as you do it. So it needs to be um, more equal and reciprocal, okay? So home care, again, hospice, how often are they making those respite stays? How often are they um, providing direct referrals? And for the your other skilled facilities, you can't be all things to all people, which we will point out. So there's going to be other places that have other areas of specialty. I don't just give you know the family member, hey, call XYZ Manor or XYZ uh, Nursing Center. No, I'll give them the exact name of the person who uh, champions those admissions. And in fact, if, if, the, if the family member's with me or they just called, I'll make that phone call myself because it's important for them to know where they got that business from because they may not be savvy enough to say to the family member or the patient, hey, how did you hear about us? You know, that's not, that is a question you always, always want to ask. Because it's good to know where people got your name. Where have they heard? Is it a friend of a friend? Did they see a, a commercial on TV? You know, what is it? Or someone they know that works for you. That's a great referral source. And then the assisted livings, the same thing. You know, always good to make sure that you're knowing where that business is coming and going from. And I'm a big proponent of assisted living facilities. If you're handling one of their patients for a short skilled stay, the... Um, lead clinician or nursing director at that assisted living should probably be a part of your care conference because they have integral insight into what that patient was like before and they're part of the family. You know, they fear that you're gonna, you're gonna kind of suck that patient into your system and never give them back. Well, as long as they're qualified again to be able to re-enter that environment and, and be uh, sustainable and, and successful, we're gonna do that but it's really good to break down those barriers and have that unification. And then your payers. So believe it or not, your payers that you work with, whether it's the folks that work at your public health um, department or your Medicaid department, those that work with um, Medicare and your intermediaries, or even your third party folks that you deal with. Um, and even if you do like workers comp, VA and those, get to know those folks because even those payers work closely with their case managers. And if you're easy to work with and you've got a relationship, they do make referrals. They do make referrals. Even, believe it or not, ombudsmen will make referrals. I know that they're supposed to be very neutral, but I've had some that say, you know, hey, look, I have people that'll approach me in Kroger's or at the grocery store. And yes, indeed, they will make referrals. And then you've got patient choice. You know, the, the, the patients, you know, they will, they will tell others. You know, my mom's 88. You know, she still lives in Chicago. She's had two skilled nursing stays, one for a back surgery, one for a subdural hematoma and two totally different centers. Um, she got a private room in each one of them. And that was sort of a, a big deal. Plus the second center had a Starbucks in the lobby, which my 90 year old stepdad really liked. And they had therapies and so forth. Well, um, she was amazing. The, the first center that had, uh, she was at uh, when she finished her therapy for the back surgery and came home, she went into the admission director's office, this is not prompted by me, and got a whole stack of her business cards that she carries in her handbag, like to church, or if she's going to uh, meet with some ladies that go out, or to something really, you know, a, a senior center event, because if she hears that someone's going in for a, a planned surgery, or someone's in a facility, or, or in the hospital, and is looking at placement, she'll say, don't waste your time going to so many places. Call that person. That's great. So those patient choice and those homegrown referrals are where it's at. And then you got community-based referrals. They're there. Um, that could be the barber that does all the fellas hair in your town. And there's, you know, one of those, if you don't think that they talk about things outside of sports and politics and girls, they do. Um, I look at the hair guy I had for 29 years and he, last year, moved to California, broke my heart because um, I was always telling him he could never retire. 
And um, anyways, when he and I started seeing one another, it sounds like it is a relationship, you know, once a month, I would see him to do my hair. He, I would say to him, how often does someone ask you about senior healthcare related services or your opinions or do you know? He says, at least every day or two, it's something. And because he, he would do hair of either the spouse or the adult child or even a, a grandchild, because he's really good at all various types of hair, um, but they trusted him and they would use him as a sounding board. So you have those members, people in key positions, um, they, they're out there, no matter no if you're in a urban, um, rural or metropolitan area. And then that word of mouth, definitely that word of mouth. Going back on the patient choice element too, just because someone told you that they picked you doesn't mean you don't bird dog that referral because sometimes they could be told, oh, you don't have a bed available. And you absolutely do. And you were first choice. So preemptively, I'm always very um, certain to track down who is following that case, whether it's an elective surgery or something you know, that was non-elective to make sure they realize that this patient has already um, communicated that this is what they want. You are reaffirming this. And even for patients that may be readmitted to the hospital, you want to make sure that um, for instance, inpatient hospice or another organization doesn't kind of swoop in there because just because they were part of your center before doesn't mean they're going to again because it's still vulnerable. So you've got to really manage that tightly. So let's talk about your capabilities and specialties. Um, these are really important because um, you all have them. You can't be all things, all people. You might, you might take care of, you know, most people can take care of some general orthopedics. They might be able to take care of some general chronic elements. But you know what, when it starts coming to specialties, really look at it, really look at what are we great at? You know, what are those parameters and why? Why are we, or how could we expand? And that's a really important 360 for yourselves. And don't become complacent or think, oh, we, we're, we've always been great at wound care because you could, you could become complacent or kind of rest on your laurels there and someone can kind of swoop in and have some new technology or have a relationship with a specialist and suddenly you're not the top game in town anymore. And that's where I find occurs is that people just, they start to just get a little bit lazy about it. And no, we've got to constantly be on our game and look at what those are. But recognize again, you can't be everything to everyone. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be. And that's why you've got those specialties that are there. It's just like um, administratively, if you're an expert in certain things, but also a phenomenal generalist, you want to surround yourself with other experts. That helps round things out, gives you some diversity there and a really good panoramic of how to provide care and how to be able to look at things. So capabilities and specialties, how do we, how do we figure those out? Um, you certainly can do formal market research. You know, I, I suggest if, if you start hearing, hey, you know, people are saying I, I'm ha I need a lot of placements for ventilator care, or there's a lot of behavioral health issues or there's the drug rehabilitation components or it might be you know again certain procedures relating to wound care or cardiac really do the dig of the analysis of the numbers don't rely on just the perceptions that's where those analytics people can really help you and you can look at the at how many cases we're dealing with so that it's real data um, look at those unmet needs that are out there and sometimes you know you're not going to uncover those you can't just just say, hey, is there anything you're seeing that isn't being met here? It must be much deeper than that of, okay, as it relates to bariatric patients, what are you seeing is a need? Or the dialysis, the cardiac care, wound care, um, ventilator services. And then make a, a commitment to developing the program of excellence. Um, it can't be just dabbling. We're not going to just put our toe in the water or straddle it. If you're going to do it, it's good. do it great. You know, be bold about it. Um, and, you, and it's okay to say, hey, we're exploring a couple of initiatives and we'll keep you posted on what direction we take. That's kind of good. That's sort of poking the bear on it and saying we're, we're considering it. And you can see what your referral sources reactions are. That's also a good way to get data um, as long as it's the real data. And then the cool part, once you start firming it up, is you can look at your protocols and best practices in collaboration with those other experts or those other people that are at the hospitals, those other physicians' practices and experts that work underneath them so that you can make it seamless. And there could be training opportunities. There could be joint collaboratives in terms of uh, the protocols. You might even be able to do some purchasing power with some things that you might need equipment-wise. And then we can create a compelling message around that. 
that's going to resonate with your referral sources, with the people that drive the business, but also the end users, and also maybe for recruiting. You know, sometimes there's people out there in the acute care level that, that think that we're not dealing with things that are exciting. They think it's boring. Well, it's anything but boring. You know, we're in a dynamic, ever-changing, really um, compelling field. And that's even take COVID out of the equation. There's so much goodness that's there and we are doing some high tech things. We really are. So let's talk about the ratings. We're all involved in those. If you're, you know, a, a four star, if you're, you know, a, a five star, three star building, fantastic because you're probably in, you know, those preferred networks um, as they change some of that criteria. Um, it's a good housekeeping seal. It's, it's great. You should have, if you've got a four or five star rating, Boy, make sure that is on every email that every employee sends out on your behalf. Make sure that that is on your letterhead, on every uh, ad that you have, both um, for recruiting as well as um, ads, ads for your programs and services should be out there. Um, I'd have it on your name tags. If you've got printed name tags, I'd say four-star or five-star building. You know, it's right there all the time resonating with people. Um, that's going to, it's going to foster your preferred network participation. You know, there were, there were some networks that were out there that, that picked who they liked. Okay. They took a relationship a little too far. They picked who they liked and then they got in trouble because their parent organization was like, wait a minute here. You got a bunch of, of organizations that have a one or a two were required by our payers. Meaning, you know, like again, the insurance providers they have contracts with to have three star or above, unless it's an such an outlier service that no one else provides it. So that is something important. You've got your managed care providers right now that are narrowing some of their networks. And you may have said, hey, look, we never had an issue with this company and how come we're getting bumped off the network? You know, you also can write an appeal letter. And if you haven't done that or you need to know how to do that, make sure you let me know. Um, also ACO involvement, top of list awareness. The lists are all compiled differently. Ask your hospital to see the list. Some of them do it by county, by alphabet. Others may do it based on where the patient lives. And they plug in on a GPS, the address, and then it kind of spits out the facilities that are closest by star rating or by uh, alphabet. You know, those types of things. You really want to look at it. And then there's could be some added perks there too. Some of them put the... the the um, preferred network or the ratings, you get bolder print than them, or you get to go to the certain committee meetings, like special committee meetings. Whereas if you're not a high rated building, you get to go to regular meetings. It all depends on market. It's all different. I've seen a lot of different models of this. And um, a lot of, just recognize a lot of those hospital organizations are changing those networks too. It's like they're on version three. It's kind of like your phone. You know, they're on 3.0 right now. And they haven't quite got their arms wrapped around it. So when we look at the ratings, you know, why are four and five star facilities operating below 84% capacity? Yeah, many are. More so now with COVID, with the impact on that and the admissions and the visitations. Yeah, they are. And it doesn't matter that they, they, they could have private rooms. That could be a new facility that has a lot of bells and whistles, gadgets and gizmos with much window dressing, okay? Um, but they're operating below it. And then there could be one and two star buildings operating above 90% capacity. I asked a um, case manager that I had never met before at a Cincinnati-based, very large hospital system. Um, she was covering a, a, a lot of caseload a high volume caseload going to skilled facilities, but she had never met me before. And I was saying, you know, well, how do you go about referring where your patients are gonna go? How does this work? And she volunteered. She says, I really like it when they have no preference. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, because then I basically refer anyone with no preference to three buildings. I said, okay, what do you base that on? She said, well, they're the ones that are gonna say yes. One of those three is gonna say yes. And they're gonna make my job easier. And I said, are you making sure that they are clinically meeting those needs? She goes, oh, absolutely that. But she goes, I don't need to worry about anything. They'll do the pre-cert. They'll do all this other stuff because I've got too high volume. And I said, well, how many patients are you sending during that particular week? One of those facilities got three patients. Another got four. And I want to say one got five. That's high volume just for those. It's no preference. And then she said, you know, I said, well, are you going to, you know, aren't you going to get in trouble by not using the preferred network? She says, well, until someone tells me to stop, 
they really aren't going to mess with me because my I'm doing two people's jobs right now. And I don't think they're going to be messing with me. It's like, wow. So yeah, it happens. And those, those buildings that she uh, had, those three buildings, two were one-star buildings and one was a two. Okay. And I do realize, you know, the rating system, let's be honest here. There are some flaws in it. There are some intrinsic flaws. If you are handling very high acuity patients, a lot of those outliers, whether it's mental health, vents, dialysis, really, really clinically complex, it does not capture that. And it's near impossible for you to get a, a high rating on it because of how the rating system is designed. But if you've got that high rating, you know, and you want to maintain it, of course you do. You know, you need to make sure you're touting that. So let's talk about the systems. Very important to have systems um, that we have all the time. And so think about your admission systems like you do nursing in the sense that med passes. We don't just do a med pass on first shift. We have med passes throughout the whole 24 hour period. Now, do you like to bundle some of them? Sure you do. Are we gonna look at efficiency factors? Absolutely. Are there certain sequencings of medications that need to be adhered to? Sure. And you also have a pharmacist that's looking at all of this. The point being that we don't just suddenly decide we're only going to do admissions at a certain time. No, it's got to be 24-7, 365. And when I said earlier, 100% response time. And that's not saying yes to 100% of those um, referrals. Of course not. You're going to get some where you're sitting here thinking, uh, we don't do peds. Or, oh my gosh, you know, we don't have a burn unit. You know, there's these, these things happen. Well, but 100% response that you're at least saying, hey, look, I got it. This doesn't align with our criteria. However, I know someone who can handle this and here's their name and number, okay? 10 minutes or less is the benchmark right now on the decision, unless it's a dramatic outlier and really solid communication. So that communication has to be um, personalized to that referral source. Some of them want you to text them. Others want you to use the portal. Some want the good old fashioned phone call. Others use a text or a fax. So you gotta look at too, where are those faxes going? Who's manning that fax machine if it's in someone's office locked up all the other times during the day? You can't wait till the next morning because it's gonna be the first one responding that gets that connectivity and the advantage, even if you are first choice. So our systems, what we're gonna to wanna to do is balance expectations. Expectations are important. I would not ever admit a patient unless I know what are their expectations of us. I want to get a good gauge. Um, and also if the patient's coherent, you know, what are their expectations? Is that in alignment with, with the responsible party, other individual that's there? Is it in alignment with who we are? Because it's when it's all disconnected that you find things don't work. The other part is as it relates to length of stay. We all know that suddenly on day 20, everybody wants to go home, right? You can't tell me everybody meets their highest level of independence and meets all their goals suddenly on day 20. So we need to work with folks from the very beginning on making sure that what is that stay going to look like? What are the checkpoints going to be? And those, those little stepping stones to ensure readiness. The biggest obstacle you have there is your payers because some of them don't give a hoot about readiness. They are going to say, well, I'm only going to give you three days. Well, you walk a fine line of saying, yes, we know that's your standard, but here's some other mitigating factors that are important relating to this patient because the last thing we want is a readmission. And we want to look at the length of stay management all the time, being watchful of that. As an administrator, always bird dogging my length of stay. You know, what are the things that are necessary that are driving it? Are we looking at them? Uh, reaching those sustainable goals through their therapies? Are they activating those habits? Um, is the family involved with teaching? Are we doing that home inspection? And now that we can't go into homes, the virtual element, which is really cool because no one wants people in their homes because they think they're going to judge their housekeeping. But then most people aren't truthful about their homes. You know, my mom included. You know, she said, oh, yes, I have a bathroom on the first floor. Well, she led, leads them to believe it's a full bath. It's not. It's a half bath. It's very tiny half bathroom, barely a powder room. Oh, yes, I can get around my kitchen. Well, not with a walker and doing a 360. It's a very narrow galley kitchen. Oh, um, yes, we have a few steps. Oh, you didn't tell them how many. And that there's like 1970s 
sculpted and shag carpet that was up and down those stairs with a pitch in the in the way the stairs moved. So yes, you know, I had to basically override when they were not going to do a home visit a couple years ago because I was like, oh, yes, she's telling you the truth, but she's lying by omission was what it was. Okay. Not so different from any of the patients we serve. And then we want to coordinate the care within the whole landscape of things by utilizing our other partners out there, um, helping them navigate what the right options are, what makes sense, what makes sense. And I'll, and I'll just, you know, that helps to decomplicate it. What makes sense? Let's look at simplifying. And then we may need to serve an advocacy role with the payers. I teach a lot of hospital-based social workers and navigators to do this because you may have, maybe you don't have a contract with a certain payer, but they want to come to you and you can provide the service and you are located across the street from them and they would have to go 40 minutes and it would create hardship, definitely create hardship. So how do you do that? It can be done at the hospital level. They can grease those skids for you and get that over, get an override on it. A lot of them don't realize that they have the ability to do that with the payers. So I do a lot of teaching there. Let me know if you need help on it. And then we want to serve as that active 360 navigator all the time. This is a journey. We are with them on a leg of the journey, but the whole journey is being judged. And in many instances, they'll be watching us. So let's look at that and make sure that those are your opportunities to market. Those are your opportunities to have touch points for communication. So if you're doing that follow-up call, and we'll talk about discharge follow-up, and you're asking them, hey, how's home care going? And they tell you that they fired their companion service, but don't tell anybody. But then you know they've got a PCP appointment. And they're probably say, yeah, that person's doing a great job. And it's not like the, the physician's office is going to call that private companion. Maybe they could call a home care company, but if it's some private situation, they're not. So you play a very key role in communication and as conduit. Those are opportunities to make sure that you are up front and center with those partners and that you're that responsive, amazing, impactful provider. Then for our systems, our occupancy. So you should know at any given time, not just in the morning during stand-up meeting, what's your occupancy today, the big picture, the small picture? Where's the movement going to be taking place? Inner, in between, whether it's, you know, do you have a little mini COVID unit there that you're banking out? Can it be used for something else? Um, I've got um, organizations where they may have had a case and then suddenly like, look, we've got this whole area available. We can do this. And they've offered themselves and developed that COVID unit for um, their hospitals. And it's been um, a welcome, a welcome opportunity because it worked for them. Also, it has to work with your um, geographic, your footprint of your building. So, but those numbers always, what's going on today? What is it going to look like tomorrow, next week, next month? Not just when utilization review meets, all the time. And those could be, again, opportunities that present themselves for potential respite stays, for strength building, for, um, and, I, and if it's respite, I always say no, um, I'll call it no mandatory or required stay amount of days. You know, I, I look at that very flexibly. Um, even though nursing gets mad, because oh, what if they're here only one day? It's very rare. Usually, you might have a frequent flyer there for a couple days every month or two, and more so even in, in assisted living. But then also, too, where are the risk factors? You know, the, the patients that are at risk for leaving because they're dissatisfied, what can we do to help increase that satisfaction level? What about the family that's always like, oh, I'm going to yank mom out, that kind of thing? What do we do about that? Because those are things that are always going to impact the back door. And so for those of us that are marketing, we get the person in, we get the person in, that's the thrill of the hunt. Then we got to make sure we're managing it up to what we promised. So that has to be in alignment, no promising and under delivering. It's got to be real. And then making sure that we're mindful to sequence it out the back door. Okay. So that's that mindful bed management. We may also have to buddy up some folks because it's the right thing to do so that you can have a greater impact for others so they don't have to go to their second choice opportunity. When I explain that to folks, it's like, would you have wanted to go to a lesser place? And it's like, no. I go, well, you can help be impactful as a co-resident or as a peer to someone else in helping us meet their needs. So discharge planning, 
You leverage it before admission. It's a strategic difference. Most pay places kind of swash it together. Even with some of the mandates now, it's still kind of haphazard. And I know sometimes that's also um, a, a reactionary mode too, when you have that specialist say, oh yeah, you can go home. And it's like suddenly the locomotive went from 80 miles an hour to 150. It's like, whoa, no, it's, it's very systematic. It's aligned. Majority of discharges we look at are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We don't like them on Friday because guess what? You're not going to get the physician, the PCP. You're going to get someone who's on call that doesn't even know them. A home care may not get started. Um, their uh, equipment may not arrive on time. Family always thinks, oh yeah, we'll get her settled in. But then suddenly Monday, it's a disaster. So we really look at one of the strategic differences here is here's how we take discharge planning as seriously as we do admissions because we want you to be successful for the long haul. And we align those expectations with what's real. Um, we also make sure there's a communication of commitment that they can't be just going to every you know uniform that they see. Hey, mom, we want mom to go home. No, you've got a point person. You have a quarterback for discharges, and it gets channeled through them. And that's part of that upfront commitment. And then, of course, there's depth in that, just like you would on the admission side of it. And then you put together a, a post acute or a post discharge portfolio traditionally a binder of some sort that has all the pictures of the people that have, have provided them care because they may not know their names, the ways to contact them, whether it's phone and email, um, all of their exercises, of course, their medications, um, uh, dietary uh, things that could be of help to them, their um, follow-up DME, their, their PCP appointments, and then a place to even put all their bills and things. And then they take, you teach them to take that binder with them when they go to the doctor's office and it's got your logo on it. Again, another reason. So it's not a bunch of papers that were stuck in an envelope and just sort of all thrown around. Because I know even when I've gone for hospital stays, it's like, oh my gosh, I have all these papers all over the place. Not fun. And systems too, you've got an individual accountability and team accountability. So I'm responsible to myself. It's kind of like mission impossible. Your mission, should you decide to accept it? And I accept it. I chose it. Again, I own it. If I chose it, I own it. And then team accountability too, of making sure that if I say I'm going to do something that I did, do what you say and say what you do. And then it's to a certain level. If I fall short, I'm going to be the first one that said I missed the mark. This is what happened. And here's how I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, very forthright on those things. And that's a culture that, again, is really important throughout all levels of team. So our technology, how does it help us get better results? It sure can, as long as the information is correct. And we all know with false positives, wrong denominators, um, decimal points in Florida that weren't right, that really helps nothing. Or the reporting that you're required to do right now, God, it's gotta be accurate. Um, it's gonna help us with our communication, again, with that accuracy, certainly the speed, but speed doesn't mean anything if it's, if it's not real data. I do like the integration. Sometimes there can be errors. I had someone else's that's name is Linda Saunders. Um, I had some of her medical information that somehow got integrated into my file on my portal where the medical assistant for my doctor, who was brand new, when I went in for a physical, she asked me how my implant was doing. And I was like, I had a dental implant, a molar, like 10 years ago. And I'm like, it's fine. Sometimes when I get a cold, because I have low sinuses, it'll still hurt. And she's looking at me, she goes, I'm talking about your hip. I was like, I do not have, I never had my hip fracture. And I showed her, no no, no uh, incision site there. Well, someone else's stuff got integrated. My doctor would have caught it because she knows me really well, but the medical assistant had never met me. So we can get alerts absolutely on your phone um, and things. So, so the marketers can be very mobile, very fluid. They can get their information anywhere. Um, there's great applications there that you can also use, even with your physicians. Um, training tools for, for your patients are great. You know, even do your admission paperwork through DocuSign. A lot of times I can work with a patient prior to them even getting in the building. You know, let's not tie up all their time while nursing's trying to do their stuff. Do it in advance if at all possible. And their equipment. Um, a big portion of your um, touting your message is your website. If there was one thing that I could tell you to invest in in marketing, it would be that. Because people don't have time to go visit. They can't visit. Um, there's people that live out of state, they're making decisions, and it may not be the person that's the caregiver here in town, it's somebody else who's got the keys to the car, and they're going to look at your website. 
So look at it with a fresh set of eyes and determine, does that really uh, resonate and convey what it is that you do? You don't want it to, um, to tell everything, you know, you, you want it to give them enough information that they call you and make contact and create that relationship. But I would certainly have your payers on there, your medical staff, I do have the, the profiles, have a little bit about each one of your leadership team members. People like that. You know, that's a little touchy feely, but they like it because right now they may not be able to see you personally. So add that. And then social media uh, reviews, people are looking at that stuff. So be watchful of it. Um, typically what we see is it's a disgruntled employee that will put something on there. And it's like, oh shoot, that's the first thing that pops up. So you got to get more social media things on Yelp and the other sites that are going to elevate that status. So um, keep an eye on that kind of thing. So leadership, the biggest thing right now, and I always say, you know, more important than your physical plans are your amazing people. So we want to hire and retain those folks as much as possible. We know that you're tired. We know that you've been resilient, but you've got a lot that we're carrying right now. Um, it's always been a, a complicated job. Uh, an incredibly rewarding job, but because we don't have the end game there, you know, it's not like a marathon where we know how long we're going to be running for, um, it keeps getting extended. So you must refuel yourself. We've got to look at ways to keep people as engaged as possible. Um, there are some creative elements there, but it's it's really important to retain those. The more retention you have, it will it will carry over into, you know, job satisfaction for the rest of the employees and their retention, as well as your occupancy and your customer and family satisfaction levels. Um, we want to create that ownership occupancy at every level. You know, everyone's responsible for helping you grow and sustain the business. That means your employees, those volunteers, the family members, the residents themselves. And attention to details. You know, it's, it's just little things make a huge difference as it relates to um, how you know your staff, how you know those residents, and it's it's just little stuff. So, you know, I know that, you know, I've got a really good memory. So it's like, I, I, if you could, if I had 250 patients and you read me off two or three things, I would know exactly what patient it was. And people go, how do you do that? And I go, it's just how I compartmentalize information, but also I, I also store it by what drives them as a person? What's important to them? How can we meet those needs? And even the most difficult of employees or the most difficult of patients that you think there's no way to make them happy. It's finding you know, those key elements or knowing the personality and what drives the personality and makes that personality empowered. Um, and then again, we want those people to grow the business. They don't know that, they, that they're such an advocate out there I mean, I was shocked when my mom went and got those uh, business cards because I thought that was the, what a cool way to help advocate to others that they'll get great care and that she trusts them and, and, and feels really good about her experience. We also want to reward innovation and creativity. Um, your grassroots staff know what's going on. We know when COVID first occurred, you know, we were getting fired so many directives from everyone, from every angle all the different agencies, nothing was in alignment. And then we're supposed to try and synergize it and figure out how do we mobilize and operationalize it. So as we're starting to refine that, your staff are phenomenal at thinking of those things. And I'll just tell them, you're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. If you, it's like, if you were the CEO, if you were running this place, how would you handle this piece? Now I don't always, you know, so first of all, I say, give everybody raises. But I mean, no, it's usually like, I'll isolate. As it relates to this, how would you do it? Your team is a very, very good at that. And they're going to be shocked that you asked if you had this or if you had this budget, how would you handle it? It's, it's really cool. And then invest in ongoing communication training, especially for our team as they're going through caregiver fatigue. You know, they're getting a little, um, they're stressed. So when they're stressed, they're not thinking as big. They are reacting. And if they're reacting, they're probably being snippy or the filter isn't there. And so they'll say something and think, oh my goodness. And people will not remember what you do. They will always remember how you made them feel. And if someone said something that was perceived as hurtful or caused them to feel a certain way, that's a really tough wound to try to heal. So just recognize communication is a big one. And then know those numbers. We talked about it. As a leader, you want to know what is your census at any given time? How many of certain types of patients do you have? How many have you had year to date? What's your average length of stay? What's your readmission rate? 
so that you can say those things with confidence. You can say them, and even if you had a higher number before, you could say, hey, we're at X, but we've dropped by X percent. Or I used to say, you know, here's our retention rate as it relates to staff or the average employee has been with us or a part of our family for this long, or how many members you've grown from within to take on more leadership or to um, go on for advanced degrees or training. And then as it relates to our patients or even certain, um, certain marketing calls, what questions or concerns can you anticipate? Maybe you took over a job from someone else and you're having to overcome some hardships or obstacles there or maybe trust was broken, that's a big one. And you inherited this, but you're having to earn that trust back. Or maybe an issue happened years ago, people never forget, and you can anticipate they bring that up again. Okay, let's, let's make sure that we address the elephant in the room and be very forthright about it. People will respect you for this. Um, and that's important, anticipate those things and train your team to do that. It, critical thinking skills are very important right now. And to work with all staff on critical thinking is a gift. So we look back at all these and you see how it fits together, your specialties, the leadership, technology, rating and relationships, that leads into the scorecard. So that's where you can culminate this to figure out your unique message. What makes you you? Who are you and why should I pick you? It's going to align with your mission and look at your results because results matter. Process is very important. I'm a very process oriented person, but I want, a, I want a good solid process with great results. Sometimes the process doesn't lender it. You know, we're still human. We are in a human business. We can still add it all up and it's like, oh shoot, what could I have done differently? What could I have avoided? Maybe nothing but we wanna look at those factors. Also your distinctive differences. What makes you special? What makes you stand beyond all these other competitors? And then I always say, put some added special sauce in it. You know, it's like you could get, you know, barbecued brisket anywhere, but what makes that one place that you always go back to special? So I call that the special sauce. And then always you create a call to action or that next step, that next step. Um, I told the group the last time I taught, there was a very, very small rural facility that came to a program I taught last year. And um, they have a lot of long-term staff, really a great spirit amongst them. And um, lots of cross-training because they're small, you got cross-train. And they were, I was saying, well, what do you, what do you reflect as being different? Because they've got bigger players and they have um, newer players that have, again, what I call window dressing. And their statement that they came up with is, we're good at being small. We're good at being small. And then they talk about their level of personalization. They talk about their outcomes. They talk about satisfaction and their connectivity. It was really compelling. And it's an old building. It's clean as can be. Like you, it's one of those you could say you could eat off the floor. It's sparkling, but it's not brand. It's not the brand new shiny penny. Let's call it that. But amazing, amazing message. Factors that don't guarantee your high occupancy, the new building, even though it'll always be interesting. It's always, everybody's, you know, wants to know what the new place is like. Um, if it's beautiful, then they're gonna expect care to be just as beautiful in an outcome standpoint and process and concierge elements. All private rooms, doesn't guarantee it. Expensive equipment, sure. How many places have an anti-gravity machine and it's collecting dust? And that's over $100,000 for that piece of equipment because they didn't realize that it takes a lot of time for patients to get in and out of the equipment and maybe they're, um, they're scared of it. It's very daunting. How do you overcome that? Um, gadgets and gizmos, it better work. You know, you've got great technology in there and lots of um, ways to gauge how call lights, how quickly they're answered and security and sensors, they need to be working. And also too, um, inducements, gifts and free stuff don't guarantee high occupancy. So if you were giving, um, Tickets to a concert, you know, there's no guarantee you're going to get those, those referrals, um, spa packages and things of that nature. No, um, it's not. And a lot of places cannot accept those or they're getting in trouble for it. Um, and, you know, there's, there's nothing like writing a letter to the CEO of the hospital telling him what fabulous staff he has. I do that all the time. And even prior to COVID, you know, I wrote this one CEO and I was telling him, 
I, I want you to know how special your staff is there and what they do to go above and beyond. I personally, and this guy has never met me before. All I do is teach classes there maybe three times a year. He personally reached out to me and he said, you have no idea what that meant on a week where you felt like everything was going wrong. And he said, I believe this about our hospital. It's a big hospital. And now it's like, I have a new connection at that level because I took the time to do it. So don't ever hesitate to, um, to compliment. And so anytime I have a patient come into a place, I'll say, who was most impactful during your hospital stay? Most of the time it's a therapist or it could be a dietary person that helps bring in a meal that they wanted or someone that found a phone charger that was comparable or comparable to what they needed for their phone. You know, that it gave them the lifeblood to call their family. So think about those things. Any questions that you may have? I know this was a lot in an hour and a half and I probably could have extended it an extra half hour. Well, I wanna thank all of you, um, thank our amazing team at Lee Agency, um, Brandon, Andy, Amber, Elise, um, for allowing us this opportunity to be together this morning. Um, if you're like me, you're gonna walk away and be like, wow, that's a lot. Hopefully some nuggets that you can implement immediately. But if you have questions, feel free to reach out through any of the four members, as I just mentioned, of the agency or directly to myself, and I'll keep them in the loop um, because at any time, you know, we're here to help. Uh, we want everyone to be successful, um, be in alignment with your mission, but also to give you these tools so that we can continue to navigate 2020, but it puts you in a, in a solid position going into the new year. So thanks to all of you. Elise, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, for everything. We appreciate it. Um, again, we recorded this uh, today. So if anybody would like us to send that to them so they can um, have other staff look at it, please let us know and, and we can send you the link. Everybody have a good day. Thanks. Thank you so much. Take care now. You too.